Good evening, Affinity and Facebook Village, and welcome to the launch of Living Room Chats at Affinity, a podcast for brave conversations and bold voices, with yours truly as your host, Kelly Suzanne Salisbury. Woo! Living Room, <laughs> I'm here in front of a live audience, so you may hear some whoop whoops. Um, Living Room Chats at Affinity is my monthly podcast that will take place the third Wednesday of each month at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time and will be live streamed on Affinity's Facebook page. We'll dive into topics like political advocacy, culture, identity, and spirituality. I'm delighted to be joined tonight by a live audience in Affinity's beautiful and cozy living room in Bronzeville on Chicago's South Side. Thank you all for being here, and thanks to those of you tuning in to Living Room Chats at Affinity via the live stream. You can join the conversation on social media at Affinity's Facebook and Twitter pages using the hashtags LRC, that stands for Living Room Chats, LRC Affinity Podcast, LRC Kelly Podcast, and of course, hashtag We Are Affinity. I'm thrilled to host Living Room Chats at Affinity in collaboration with Affinity Community Services, an organization that is near and dear to my heart. I've had the, I not only have the honor of being a constituent, but a former board member and uh, past board president. I'd like to first thank Affinity's Executive Director, Imani Rupert Gordon, and the Affinity Board of Directors with a special shout out to Anna Deshawn and Jovan Watkins for their partnership, support, and warm and fuzzies. Let's give them a warm round of applause. <laughs> For the past few years, I've been wanting to host a podcast where I could have brave conversations with bold voices from different backgrounds, walks of life, and perspectives. To have conversations that move beyond the superficial and safe to an authentic place where we can be ourselves, dare to question things, and candidly express what we think and how we feel. While I'm happy to be a part of the Affinity family, the views I express here are my own or the views of the individual guest. These views do not necessarily express the views or opinions of Affinity Community Services. Tonight, I'm honored to have Sia Siang as my very first conversation partner. Sia and I first met several years ago while they were a fellow in the Affinity Scholars Program, and I was on the board. I was captivated immediately by Sia's imagination, intelligence, quiet strength, and deep spirituality. It has been a delight to recently reconnect and have heart-to-heart -heart conversations with them about how our lives have unfolded over the past several years. There's a theme I notice in our conversations around the questions of who are we, who do we want to be, and what are the things that hold us back? We'll take a deep dive into these waters during tonight's conversation. But first, allow me to share Sia's bio with you. Sia Siang is magic, a celestial being originally from a galaxy unknown. They were brought to Chicago by way of the womb of a goddess. The continuous pursuit of personal growth is their life's work. Multi-layered and polylithic identity, everything and nothing at all. Sia is perfectly flawed an experience of the senses and can be found in your discomfort. Let's welcome Sia. So welcome Sia to Living Room Chats at Affinity. I'm so excited that you're my first conversation partner. Thank you so much for doing this with me. Thank you, Kelly. I'm honored. When I got the email, I was like super stoked and <laughs> couldn't believe that I was asked to be the first guest. I'm okay. very, very, very pleased to be so. Excellent. I'm so glad that you're here. So first I have to say, like, uh, when you shared your bio with me, I was really blown away by it. I found it super creative and very intriguing. And I'm used to bios that, you know, have a pretty matter-of-fact language um, and are conventional. So I would, I would love to invite you to, you know, share to me your inspiration behind your bio, um, how that reflects who you are. And I'd also like to invite you to continue introducing yourself a little bit. Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm learning more and more that I'm unconventional. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't know this <laughs> prior to maybe the past three years of my life, mm -hmm. 
But um, when you asked me about a bio, I was like, oh, this is an opportunity where I'll get to like really express myself and really share something that uh, is a, in alignment with me and who I am and how I feel versus what I think people think are important. Like, what do I think is important? Where am I from? How do I see myself? How do I see my existence? And how do I share that? You know, like, I identify as a being. I'm, I'm many things, right? I'm a sibling. I'm a <clears throat> co-parent. I am a student, an aspiring neurologist, a friend, a community organizer, a lover. But all of these things come down to being. Mm -hmm. I am a being. Mm -hmm. And so anything that I do on this planet in this life is an iteration of just that, being. Mm -hmm. And so I was really happy for the opportunity to be myself. It's a beautiful bio. And actually, as a matter of fact, it your bio inspired me to, hmm, when someone asks me for my bio, I don't have to give the typical LinkedIn bio. <laughs> like, depending on who the audience is, let me allow my voice and different manifestations to come through. So your bio reminded me of that, to not to sort of get outside of the box a little bit. Yeah, don't confine yourself. Yeah, you know, yeah. people will put us in boxes all the time. Why are we doing it to ourselves? Yeah, yeah. So let's take a little trip down memory lane. So Sia and I uh, first met in 2009 uh, when you were a scholar in the Affinity Scholars Program. And I was on the board at the time. And so I want to ask you, so what brought you to Affinity? How did your time with Affinity impact you? And what have you been up to since? Hmm. Well, um, I was living in Washington, D.C. I was working at Energy Action Coalition as the Environmental Justice Fellow. And um, that program was ending. I realized that I didn't want to be the co-director of the Environmental Justice uh, Department. Um, and Aisha called me. It was actually Kokuma called wow. me and was like, Aisha wants to speak with you. Uh -huh. And I held Aisha up to great esteem. She was like the person, the one and only person I ever met in the organizing scene that was really, really smart, like a super intellectual, but also hood as fuck, you know what I mean? <laughs> and these things I had not seen before, mm -hmm. and um, I was drawn to it. And so we yeah. saw each other around, mm -hmm. but we didn't necessarily have a relationship. And so when Kokuma gave me her number to call, I called her and she was like, hey, I think, uh, the scholars program would be really good for you and that you should apply and at the time I um, had issues with writing I didn't uh, I think like any uh, person of color or black person I don't, I'm going to be very specific any okay. black person from a very urban area where mm -hmm. your education isn't very good mm -hmm. and I don't know you question your ability to really show up mm -hmm. and uh, it be considered good or well mm -hmm. um, and so it was an essay was required to get into the scholars program yeah. and the deadline was maybe a day or two away, and Aisha called me and was like, hey, I haven't received your application, and I was like, ah, oh, the essay. Yeah, <laughs> you were nervous about yes. that. You were nervous. Yes. Yeah. Um, and she was like, well, just do it. Just do it. Just show up. Take a chance. Yeah. yeah. And so I did. Um, I learned a lot through Affinity Community Services, especially being a scholar. Uh, Affinity was the first organization that I was a part of that was all black. Mm -hmm. That. <laughs> that was um, that was a unique experience, and then to have so many femme identified folks, but then to have femme identity be seen in so many different ways, it was a variation yeah. of what it was to be femme or what it was to be woman. Um, it was great. There were a lot of challenges. There were a lot of complications. There was a lot of discomfort, um, and I think Aisha, as a Pisces, really, uh, one, she's brilliant, uh, a wonderful being but also her compassion and mm -hmm. ah. <laughs> uh, also her compassion um, was really helpful in navigating these extremely uncomfortable conversations. And it made me like really reflect, she made us reflect on what it is to be committed, not only to the work that we were doing, but to one another. Mm -hmm. And what does that commitment look like? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so, so that was impactful. And then Lisa, Yes. was really yes. like I can be seen I have been seen mm -hmm. I am seen mm -hmm. in some ways as being very fierce and also ferocious yes. and so to meet someone who had a very similar like candor mm -hmm. and strength mm -hmm. and unapologetic like raw yes. 
yeah. you know, was um, fundamental to, I think, who I am today, actually. Mm -hmm. I don't think it, I know it. Mm -hmm. It was fundamental to who I am today. What is it called when you say uh, uh, representation is important? Yeah. Um, yeah. And in the organizing world, I, you know, it was cool and I enjoyed it a great deal, but I was seen as a very particular type of person, mm -hmm. right? I'm a person from the west side of Chicago. I speak like a west sider. I worked really hard and deliberately to have this type of accent and to have this vocabulary because I wasn't necessarily heard. I was often uh, dismissed as being mm -hmm. aggressive, right? And so to meet a person that was like brilliant and like running their own shit and doing their own thing and respected and loved, like was in a partnership, it was just, it was like, okay, I can make it. I can, I can do this. And um, Lisa really helped me see that in myself. Actually, after Affinity Community Services, like after the scholars program, I was like a little disheveled. Um, and Lisa shared, Lisa and Rima shared their home with me. And I come from a really, I, I moved out of my mother's house at 14. And so I've been living wherever, <laughs> one of my best friends, you know, lived at her house for a good deal of time. Like her mom would let me come over whenever, if it was 6 a.m., <laughs> she'd be cool. Um, but me and my mother had a really interesting and complicated relationship, right? Like sometimes people give birth to uh, their pain, right? And I, I felt like I was I was there for my mother, but we were committed in, in growing in this relationship and it, it was best I felt if we didn't live together. And she was always about choosing happiness. And so she had no qualms about me not necessarily living with her. And so Lisa, um, I was like having a difficult time with my girlfriend at the time. Um, I was trying to figure out if I wanted to go to school. I was trying to, like, just there was just so much. And they shared their home with me, not asking me for money at all, but to, like, show up and um, do chores, but to, like, show up for myself, be committed to myself. And so they laid the strong foundation for me to genuinely take flight. Um, and it was in living with Lisa that I was able to really see myself, um, see my fears, see what I didn't think I could have, see what I wanted. And uh, it was interesting. It was, it was fundamental. I'm grateful for them. Grateful for them. It sounds like you share some, uh, some people in common who really inspired us for those of you who may not know who Aisha is, Aisha um, is a current constituent of Affinity and she was the um, director of the scholars program um, at Affinity. And the Lisa, uh, the Lisa that we're talking about is uh, one of the uh, founders of Affinity and is a task force president. And both of them have been incredibly important in my life as well. Uh, Lisa was one along with Kim, um, uh, one of my uh, mentors I learned a lot from her, leadership development, and when I was young and coming out um, and realizing who I was as a lesbian uh, person um, and dealing with the struggles of family who uh, struggled accepting my sexual orientation, the affinity community really embraced me where I was able to be at home and find community. And um, I, in terms of Aisha, I knew that she would be wonderful at affinity as the director. And I invited her, I was like, would you be willing to consider working here? You know, so it's beautiful to have these common connections. And it seems like affinity for both of us um, allowed us an opportunity to create community, to see ourselves reflected, and to grow in ways that we hadn't even imagined. Absolutely. Um, so that, Absolutely. That's a beautiful thing to share. Um, so since I've known you, you've been a huge advocate and organizer. You touched on uh, your organizing work in DC. And, uh, and obviously, when you moved from DC to Chicago, you were all, you also did a lot of community organizing and advocacy work. So I'd like to I'd like you to talk a little bit about what led you to organizing and what issues are most what issues are you most passionate about and why? Um okay. So I'm from Chicago, the West Side, Austin, represent all day, all day, no matter where graduating from finishing my residency, I will throw up the West Side hand. All day, all day. <laughs> so, um, so I bring that up, one, because it's definitely an important piece of who I am, but also like to grow up in a community where uh, you have unwelcoming sterile medical facilities that engage you as numbered inconveniences and um, schools who can't afford textbooks but have the budget for um, like 
the budget for on-site police officers and a office dedicated to them, mm -hmm. um, a community with no grocery stores, it was, it was strange, you know? And then to be Sia, this really interesting young person, I didn't identify as a boy, I didn't identify as a girl, I identified as Sia. And um, to be in a world that's like, very binary, mm -hmm. where you have to be one or you have to be the other, and they're both extreme, where thin is in, and I was quite chubby. My nickname is Fat. Um, I was a really uh, plump young person. I would have never guessed that. Yeah. 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 Um, and I'm dark skinned, and so it's like thin is in, lighter complexion is preferred, and, and it's not necessarily said directly, mm -hmm. but it's everywhere. It's on the television, it's in the shows you watch, it's and who your cousins and your friends choose to be with and who they're not choosing to be with. Um, like my mother would not say that I was beautiful, she would say that I was very smart. And my lighter skinned sister and my lighter skinned brother were really, really attractive. And I don't think that it was intentional because my mother was a dark skinned woman, you know? And so this, so deciding to like, realizing that something wasn't right, like everything felt, there was a dissonance. There was a dissonance and there was tension. Like how can you be loved and have this person say that they love you and have people say that they love you, yet you feel harmed so consistently. Mm -hmm. It didn't match. Um, and so then I read Allegory of the Cave. Ah, we talked about yes. that. And I was sophomore year of high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dante Inferno, Allegory of the Cave. Uh, I stand by it, changed my life, <laughs> changed my life. Um, but I remember like, one of the questions that came up was, what would I do if I was a free person? What would I do? And I would speculate over and over again. What would I do? What would I do? What would I do? And then it hit me. Like, I felt shackled to beliefs that caused toxins, like pain in my body, in my mind, in my spirit. Um, so I was enslaved. I was enslaved to internalized oppression passed down as fact. And so I, I needed to be free. And I wanted to be free. I wanted to be free for anybody who, for my family, for my friends, anyone who felt that structural violence and systematic oppression were inevitable. And I didn't have the language at the time. Sure. I just had a lot of fury. Yes. Um, and so community organizing was, was it just made sense. And at the time, 15, sophomore year of high school, I was in Europe. And there was this person, Lily Molina, who's also a really good friend uh, right now, but she's my first, first youth worker. And she used to take me everywhere. She, you know, she had a car, so she'd take me to all of these diff different things. She was really, uh, social justice oriented. She was the only one in the program that had uh, a community college degree, but didn't necessarily have her bachelor's degree yet. And so she talked about the struggles that came from these things. Um, she's Latinx from Honduras, um, and she was an environmental justice advocate and organizer. And we also both played capoeira. And so it was just like, so I started like speaking out, I started so I making space, advocating for space in my high school for LGBTQ folks, um, at getting on the lunchroom table in high school and talking about sex because we only had abstinence ed. And so like having these loud conversations about sex during lunch periods that weren't mine. Um, and then I graduated from high school and was introduced or was introduced to the idea of sanctuary and sanctuary city. And uh, Flo Persis almost who was in Alabaster Church, and um, and so that's that's where I started. And I would say issue an issue that's important, uh, or that I'm most uh, sorry, 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 that I care most about. I would I don't think I have an issue actually. Mm -hmm. They're all intersectional, mm -hmm. and so I think what I'm most obsessed about. Yes is um, how structural violence and systematic oppression can be, are they seen as trauma, right? Can they be defined as violence? Can we restructure how we define violence? And what does that do to a person? What does that do to not only their cellular development, but their neurological development? And does it somehow cause a physical ailment, right? How does it, how does it shift your perspective and seeing the world and seeing the people around you and seeing yourself? And does that ultimately cause disease? Mm -hmm. And so I guess, I guess all of them. That, <laughs> that's, that's a perfect segue, because I was gonna ask you, like I was just gonna say, so you recently uh, finished
to Harold Washington College. Woo-woo. You recently <laughs> go, where you actually studied behavioral health and mental wellness. I got an Associates of Science. Yes, Associates of Science and Behavioral Health and Mental Wellness. Thank you for the clarification. And I know that you are interested, we talked about this before, you're interested in continuing your education um, and with a focus, a pre-med track, uh, mm -hmm. with a focus in family neurology. And so I, I'm listening to you, I heard you connect the work that you do, your organizing work in communities with health and wellness, with family, with the healthy development of communities. And so my question to you was going to be like, how do, how do your studies and how does the work that you wanna do sort of reflect your values? Um, and congratulations, by the way. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. I'm in the process of applying to schools to transfer to currently. Um, oh, oops. <laughs> Should we do it again? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, yeah, the, uh, so, I guess I use, my values were instilled in me by my mother and mm -hmm. uh, by way of Narcotics Anonymous, which is, I was raised in Narcotics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so my values come from definitely a 12-step program. And so something I noticed in organizing, like I feel like, well, well I'll only speak for myself. Mm -hmm. But going into organizing, I was like, rah, rah, you know? And I was like, yeah, this is gonna be utopia. You know, mm -hmm. we're all working for the greater God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guilty of that too. When I was in my 20s, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And what I realized is, yo, we're all raised, indoctrinated, culture of normalized violence. And whether that looks like uh, racism, sexism, patriarchy, misogyny, homophobia, ableism, whatever it is, those are all forms of violence, mm -hmm. right? And so um, how in the hell can we all come together and not bring our shit with us? Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. But the conversation wasn't had. Mm -hmm. The conversation wasn't had. We were always focused on the outside enemy. Yes. Right? The outside enemy. Oh, we need to... This person's our target. Mm -hmm. This this group is our target. Mm -hmm. Yet I'm not heard because I sound like a nigga from the West Side. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm being dismissed because my language isn't as poetic or as pretty. Mm -hmm. um, mm. That you can have a room full of queers and, or LGBTQ identified folks. You know, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to identify anybody. If I you know, yeah. self identify. Um, and racism is still thriving. You know, or heteronormativity is normalized because, and it's it's not a problem because we're same gender loving people. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like yep. okay, mm -hmm. I'm confused. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm confused, mm -hmm. and that's when I realized, like, oh, these are patterns that I see. These are the patterns that drove me out of my mother's house. These are the ooh, these are the patterns that uh, drove me into organizing, and these are the patterns that pushed me to really think about how we define violence. Because at first, violence was only a physical. I feel like people are having conversations about it only being a physical thing. Right. You know? And so yeah. what is it to like live in a community that doesn't have a grocery store or a sit-down restaurant mm -hmm. or a bank? Right. Mm -hmm. What is that? What is it to go to school? Only check cashing places. Yes. Right? Yeah. That charge you for cashing a check. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is it to depend on the corner store for your groceries, mm -hmm. for yourself and your kids? That's a form of violence. And so I remember being around like these pacifists who were like, yeah, you know, we don't do that. We are better mm -hmm. than that. We will go about nonviolent uh, means, right? And I was like, fuck that, throw a rock in that building. You know, mm -hmm. throw a rock in that window. Let's go over here. And they're like, see, you're being so violent. It's like, no, 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 I'm defending myself. Mm -hmm. I'm defending myself. Let's redefine violence. So then to be in this organizing community or this organizing scene and to feel unseen, Right. You know, and then when I am being seen to feel judged because I'm not respectable enough mm -hmm. was quite intriguing. Mm -hmm. And so it made me think, you know, yeah, we're all being socialized in the same shit. Yeah. And we're all bringing it. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we use the parts of it that work for us, that work for our agenda. Right. You know, but we also hold the other parts with pride. Mm -hmm. So that's what led me there. And like, what is it to be sick, you know? Mm -hmm. What is it to be sick and tired? What is it to see so many people dying of illnesses that can be prevented? Mm -hmm. What is it 
to feel like angry, to be so angry that you you can feel that you are going to make yourself sick, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not gonna say that my my drive to do this is altruistic. Is that the word? Mm -hmm. But okay, that's the word. <laughs> <laughs> it is altruistic. Yeah. It was primarily for self, mm -hmm. wanting to heal myself, wanting to understand my mind, wanting to understand my feelings, wanting to understand the pain that I was feeling, wanting to understand my fury, mm -hmm. wanting to understand my fight, wanting to understand my thoughts and my mind and the multiple beings that I felt was inside of me. Mm -hmm. And then the self-reflection, the self-awareness, allowing me to understand this larger entity, right? Mm -hmm. I only see myself as a fractal, uh, iteration, if you will, of this larger fracture. Mm -hmm. And so, that's how I got there. So it, what I'm hearing is that from your community, not only were you working on issues that impacted communities you were a part of, issues of access, issues of equity, but actually being in these spaces with other human beings, and all of us are bringing um, how we're raised, our beliefs, our values, our biases, how we're socialized. We all bring that with us to every space that we go. Like, you know, that expression, no matter where you go, there you are. <laughs> so it seems, it seems to me that in your work with other people in community organizing spaces, you also got a chance to see to really get in touch with how you were feeling, your own pain, your own trauma, your own desires, and what what you wanted to do to begin to heal yourself. Yeah, yeah. I felt like organizing gave me the tools and the language to understand the system in which we live in and that it wasn't personal. And so how my mother treated me wasn't personal. Mm -hmm. You know, how the police officer treated me isn't personal. Mm -hmm. So then I was able to step back from it a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like, you know, I, I'm tired of, I remember making the statement in an organi <laughs> organization that I was working at, and I was like, I don't want to work on campaigns. Mm -hmm. I, uh, and why? Well, because I need to be my first target, mm -hmm. you know? I understand that they're like, oh, you know, we don't have access to these things. I understand all of this, and these are all important, right? Everybody has a different role. Mm -hmm. But I kept asking myself, what is my role? To going from community organizing to youth organizing to then creating programs and running them and implementing them to see the problem, the, the patterns were still there. Mm -hmm. And so then it's like, okay, I could be mad at all these people for projecting their shit on me, or I could actually do the work of figuring out how these people are reflections of me. Mm. How I am projecting my shit onto other people. Mm -hmm. You know, like where is the disconnect between me and my family? Where is the disconnect between me and my community? Where is the disconnect between me and me? Mm -hmm. um, and so I decided to go inside. <laughs> yeah. You decided to take a journey within. Yeah. And so during your journey within, what would you share with us some realizations about yourself that you discovered may have surprised you? Uh, I, it shouldn't have been surprising, but it was surprising that I did not love myself. Mm -hmm. And I said I did. I thought I meant I did, but I didn't. You know, I didn't like being dark skinned. I didn't like being from the West Side. I didn't like coming from um, poor parents who only had an eighth grade graduation. My mother, my father was illiterate, you know? And so um, I didn't like who I was, and I had to ask myself whose standards am I living by, you know? Um, I think it's really easy to dislike yourself. I, I remember being at a party, a community org and the party was filled with community organizers, and I'm ranting about math. Ranting about it, like, oh my God, taught myself math, love math, uh, I've taken up to calculus too, and have not had to look inside of the book. My brain just naturally, like, mm -hmm. it just happens, you know? It's just a thing that happens. I hope to get up to linear algebra and differentials. I'm really excited about machine learning, but, um, I'm ranting about it, and like everybody, I've been organizing with these people for years, and none of them had any idea. Mm. You know, and I was like, yeah, what the fuck? Like, it really hit me. Like, these people don't know me. Mm -hmm. What we do know is we down with the cause, you know? So, mm -hmm. so I'm like, to be surrounded by people who consider me friends, who consider me an ally. Mm -hmm. um, the air quotes. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm mean, yeah, um, the air quotes. I, again, mm -hmm. not everything's for everybody. Right. You know, <laughs> not everything's for everybody. Um, 
And so I was like, you know, I haven't shared myself with them. Mm-hmm. Why haven't I shared myself with them? Mm-hmm. And what was the, when you asked yourself that question, what, what was your answer? Or did you have one at the time? I didn't. But I realized I didn't like myself. I created lies to um, present a different person, mm-hmm. right? Like, to be a different person, to live with myself every day. I had to be a different person. Mm-hmm. Um, and then to, like, I realized that I didn't know myself. Mm-hmm. I didn't know the thing that I was passionate about. I knew I was angry about not having access, angry about being hungry, angry about how my mother was treated because of how she sounded, the mm-hmm. way that she spoke, angry at the fact that I had to watch endless uh, Frasier and um, Seinfeld just to understand humor and to understand mm-hmm. how people expected me to speak, right? Mm-hmm. So that I could be heard and mm-hmm. so that I could be felt and so that I could have space. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I worked on it. You know, I worked on my relationship with my mother. Mm-hmm. I worked on my, my relationship with my community. I realized that I didn't mind being the hood nigga from the West Side who just mm-hmm. so happened to be smart. Mm-hmm. I didn't mind. Um, and so then more of my friends became people from where I was from mm-hmm. and not these people who had this beautiful poetic language who could talk about these theoretical things mm-hmm. and still perpetuate the shit as if it was nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, And yeah, there are a couple. Thank you for sharing that. That's 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 definitely that that journey within takes a lot of courage, and I think that some of us, I can I can say at least for myself, that there, there there was definitely a time in my life when I was afraid to take that journey within. I had tons of insecurities, a lot of fears. I was um, very concerned about what other people thought of me. Um, and really incredibly needy for my family's approval in particular. Um, They had certain expectations about who I should be, how I should present myself, what I should study, uh, the kinds of schools I should go to. And it takes courage to get to know yourself and say, yes, these are other people's expectations, but this is not true to who I am. I don't like how I feel. I don't like what I'm doing. Um, I'm not tapping into my own potential. And that, that takes a lot of courage. And so I just want to say I really commend you for, for taking that journey within. It, it, it is not at all easy. Um, and it can be very painful. But there are a couple things that you brought up that um, that really connected with me. You, you talked about in, in a lot of social justice spaces and in the nonprofit world. Um, there's a tendency to, to think that, oh, because these organizations are very mission driven um, and have lofty missions and value systems that there can be a, a kind of blind eye turned to, in some ways, the injustices, the inequities and disrespect that are you know, built into the organization, if you will, uh, regardless of people's intentions. And that's something that I definitely experienced as a bright eyed 20-something-year-old person who just thought, I'm going to work in nonprofit, I want to help change the world and those things. And the fact of the matter is, no matter what sector we're in, you know, private sector, public sector, what have you, uh, we are all humans bringing our best and our worst with us. And so, you know, I, I wanted to ask you, like, you know, what, what you talked a lot about anger, you know, anger toward your family, anger toward the, um, the BS that you have to put up in some of the social justice spaces that seem to run antithetical to their mission, you know, anger at what you were seeing in your environment, a lack, a lack of equity, a lack of grocery stores that served healthy food. So how did you move from anger and deficit to a feeling of abundance and things that you could do and a constructive channeling of your anger? Um, well, organizing helped. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really enjoyed youth organizing specifically because they were honest and they were real, mm-hmm. you know, and I didn't have to pretend. I didn't have to put on a face. I didn't have to be respectable, you know, like yeah. I could just be Sia. Yeah. Um, and so that was really, <laughs> that was a saving grace. Mm-hmm. Um, also, my Lisa, mm-hmm. uh, who I call my non-biological parent, <laughs> um, uh, Lisa would challenge me. Mm. You know, she would challenge me in this way that was loving and invigorating mm-hmm. and annoying. You know, <laughs> so, I can see that. it's all of it. All of it. <laughs> she challenged me too. <laughs> all of it. 
But it wasn't until living with her that I was like, okay, I'll try to go to school. I didn't go to school because I didn't think I was smart enough. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't. I was like, oh, I'm smart to be a West Sider. But I'm not smart, like Einstein smart, because only uh, pioneering scientific explorers and discoverers are white, and they're mm-hmm. men, on, and you know, there's the occasional white woman who mm-hmm. uh, is the exception. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was Lisa who pushed it, you know? Like, if this is what you want to do, then do it. Mm-hmm. And I got A's, and I realized that I didn't have a hard time. Mm-hmm. And so then I made excuses and was like, oh, it's because I'm in junior college. Um, you know, that, so it's coming easy to me because I'm in junior college. So you couldn't it's, accept your own brilliance. No, <laughs> no, I still can't, but uh, I'm not letting it stop me. Right. You yeah. know, I'm not letting my own insecurity stop me. Mm-hmm. Um, and also my mom, you know, like my mother was very clear growing up. There was no hierarchy. She wasn't like, I'm right and you're wrong. You're small and I'm big. She's mm-hmm. like, hey, you know what? Uh, we're all growing together. I don't know what I'm doing, mm-hmm. and uh, we're just gonna learn as we go. And mm-hmm. she would say, like they, they didn't write a book on how to raise Sia. Mm-hmm. No one wrote a book on how to raise Sia. Right. So let's let's figure this out together. Um, and you know, if I wanted to be someone else, she'd allow me to be someone else. If I told her that my name was something else, she'd refer to me as that name in that day. You know, the whole day, and she would tell everybody else, hey, 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 her name isn't that. I went by he pronouns for a very good portion of my life mm-hmm. um and so my mother was like hey hey hey, he mm-hmm. you know and so she, she was it wasn't if if it came down to if it came down to um my happiness and her ego she'd always check her ego mm-hmm. she'd always check her ego mm-hmm. you know um and i didn't really i didn't really get to appreciate that and respect that about her until she passed away which was like three years ago mm-hmm. um i was so angry at her I was just so angry at her that she didn't hold me up to the same standards that white people held up to their kids, you know? And so I was gonna be a failure, a fucking failure, because my mother was so focused on being happy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you right, know? Right. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but she, yeah, she like, choose happiness for her. You know, I talk to her and I'd be like, I can't create this person. I'm gonna fight them. I'm gonna kill them. I'm gonna destroy them. And she's like, you know, what makes them different from you? Have you never lied? Mm. Have you never cheated? Mm-hmm. Have you never mm-hmm. done those things? Mm-hmm. You know, and so and I'm like, why did they do this to me? Why not you? That was her response. Mm-hmm. And so her, wow. she had three values that she worked really hard to instill in me. Mm-hmm. More than three, but these are the overarching. Mm-hmm. Know thyself. Mm-hmm. So that if somebody's calling you ghetto or hood or whatever, you're not trying to rip their head off because you're secretly mad at them because you don't know if you're those things or not. Mm-hmm. You know? Wow. To thy own self be true, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. So like, after you know yourself, after you got a good head of uh, who you are, then be honest. Mm-hmm. Be honest. And she'd always say, "You can lie to me, but don't lie to yourself." Right. You know. Wow. And then uh, choose happiness. Mm-hmm. Reminding me regularly that happiness is a choice. Yeah. If you are not happy, mm-hmm. it is not the fault of anyone else. She said it. It's not my fault. You're not happy. Mm-hmm. It's not because I'm not a good mom. It's because I'm. You were choosing not to be happy. And I used to get so furious at her for saying such a thing. How dare you say that? You're right. You know, how dare you make me accountable for my own life and my decisions? <laughs> you know? How dare you? Yeah. Um, Those are powerful. Yeah. I mean, know thyself. To thy own self be true. And choose happiness. Your mother was phenomenal in that Indeed. way. I mean, those Indeed. are, talk about incredible um, life lessons and things that can carry you through and helping you get in touch with your own humanity and to not feel just like a victim, but as someone who is an agent of change and who can evolve and who can grow and who can move in the world um, and change things, not only for yourself, but for your communities and for society, not constantly in opposition to yeah. other people, but in collaboration with other people. And I think that what a powerful, what powerful lesson to teach you. And in terms of choose your happiness in, in, in Buddhist practice, um, we embrace that very much so. That happiness is not something that is just a destination or that you can, that can be bestowed upon you, but we have to work to create and develop our happiness. And a kind of happiness and unabiding joy that isn't easily swayed. So um, this is 740, so I just have the last 
a question for you. Who would you say you are today? And who do you want to be? And for what encouragement would you share for those people perhaps who feel blocked um, or discouraged from being who they truly are and who they want to be? Okay. I am a celestial being, forever evolving, forever evolving. And that's exactly who I'd like to be. Um, and so I'm very grateful to be 30 years old and um, to be able to say that I am the person that I want to be. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and self mastery is is the the goal. I that's why I'm here. Mm. Um, in terms of what encouragement would you would you share <laughs> with with some of us who may feel blocked or discouraged from being who we truly are or who we want to be? And uh, yeah, I would say I have not experienced love greater than my own. Mm. It okay. is healing, and it also sets a standard for the relationships that I have mm -hmm. and that I develop. Um, it's frightening to choose to be who you are, especially when you live in a world where who you are is the antithesis of everything that they see as great. Mm -hmm. um, Do you want acceptance at your own expense? Mm. Are you willing to actively destroy yourself to fit in somebody else's box? Mm. And if so, then that's your decision to make. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I don't judge you, as long as you're aware that that's the decision that you're making. Mm. Um, and if you want to be free, be free. Be free. And I'm a fan of therapy. So you don't have to do it by yourself. Right. You don't have to uncover and unpack all the shit that's been uh, piled upon you um, for your entire life. You don't have to do it by yourself. There are people who uh, are specialized in helping. Allow them to. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go on this journey alone. No. And we're never really alone. Never alone. Even when we think we are. Absolutely. That's wonderful. I would like to turn it now over to the audience for questions. Thank you. All right. So there's some questions for you, Sia. I don't think people will write questions. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you get, there's, so, there's, there's so much here in the conversation. We've given so much to think about, so food for the spirit and the mind. I knew there, there were going to be questions. Okay. Absolutely. So, all right. So here we go. First question. You discussed journeying inside self for self discovery. What was the root? Meditation, uh, drugs, uh, however you define drugs, therapy. You touched on that a little bit, but would you like to elaborate? All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my mother um, pushed uh, masturbation. She's very big on masturbation. Wow. Before you allow someone to discover your body for you, you know, wow. you figure out what you like, how you like it, you know, what your skin feels like. Um, so that was really helpful. Um, <laughs> so forward thinking. My mama was, yo, I wow. came to the Chicago through the womb of goddess. Wow. That Indeed. goddess was your mother. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Have not met another human like her. And even when we had issues as a, mm -hmm. like, I hated her as a mom loved her as a human being. She's wow. still by far my favorite human being. Mm. Um, mm. The, Powerful. but therapy, I've been in therapy since I was 11. Okay. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Wow. I have had this mind since I was a child. Uh, and sometimes it would cause serious panic. And so um, it was pushed that I'd be in therapy as a, a younger person. I was also self, uh, uh, what is it? Self-harming. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Um. But psychotherapy was the best. Mm. DBT, di mm. dialectical behavioral therapy, specifically. Okay. Right. You know, for you traumatized beings out there. Mm -hmm. I was very aware that I was a traumatized being and I needed very particular care. Mm -hmm. um, meditation. Uh, meditation was very hard. I couldn't, I couldn't get there. Uh, I started meditating within the past five years and I started at one minute and one minute was treacherous. It was terrible. It was the worst <laughs> thing I ever experienced in my life. And now I'm at 20 minutes. 
Um, oh, that's big. Yeah, and yeah. I enjoy it a great deal. Yes, it's, it's fantastic. For very active minds like ours, silent meditation can be <sighs> challenging at first, but you have to stick with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, marijuana. So, you know, <laughs> THC has, uh, there are four points in the, the brain, right? Mm -hmm. And THC, I'm not saying that those four points are created for THC. I'm not saying that. But mm -hmm. what I'm saying is that, like, to smoke, some people are like, oh, I experience paranoia, so I don't smoke. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's the whole point. You know, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily to experience paranoia, but it will bring your shit back to you. It will mm -hmm. reflect your shit back to you. Mm -hmm. And it pushes you to focus. Like, you have all these thoughts so you can get distracted and go to yeah. all these things. Right. Marijuana is like, you you slow down and it drills in. And so making the active choice to smoke. I, I don't need to smoke a blunt. It's too much weed for me. Mm -hmm. But I could do a one hit and then... I see it or I feel it. There's a message that comes through. Mm. And I'll talk to myself as if I'm not myself, which sounds wild. I don't care. And so <laughs> it really helped me. And so then I will start journaling like, oh, okay, I'm feeling things around being unworthy. And this is showing up in all of these other ways. And so then I'll just start journaling mm. what I feel and what I think. And then a response to what I journaled would also come through me. Mm. You know, and uh, it was also because, you know, I didn't shy from that because my mother reminded me that God is within me. Mm -hmm. I remember telling her that I didn't believe in God at 14. It's like, yeah, mom, I'm not into that. She was like, that's fine. You need to believe in something bigger than yourself, though, because mm. you're not the end all to be all. That's right. And <laughs> it was really helpful. And, you know, I'm also a fan of psychedelics. Mm -hmm. I haven't gotten there yet, but that's the plan. I got a list of them just to see where <laughs> I can be taken. Mm. You know what? Who am I really? Who am I in this large, large uh, cosmic yes. the universe? And are drugs really, is it really just my mind taking me to a place? Or is it something else? Who knows? I like to experience it. Also, as a person that's studying cognitive science, pff, mm. why not? You see yourself as your own lab. Absolutely. <laughs> I've always used myself as my own lab. <laughs> All, right. All right, so there are a few more questions that... Um, I'd like us to get through. So, Sia, if you could talk to your younger self, what would you tell yourself? <laughs> I say, yes, you chubby. <laughs> yes, you dark skin. Yes, your head nappy. And you brilliant. And you're beautiful. And you're smart. And it's going to be hard. This journey is going to be hard. Um, but you are more than capable. And so continue to move forward. Continue to swim. Continue to swim. No matter what happens, mm -hmm. continue to swim. And listen to your mom. Mm -hmm. Listen to your mother. Listen to your mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're beautiful, you're fine as you are, and listen to your mother. Yes. Okay. So, the standards, another question. The standards white people told their kids to, uh, let's see, do black people hold their children to the same standards? And what are those? So I used to be a nanny mm -hmm. um, for white homes. Uh, and the, I also used to be a sex worker, to be honest, mm -hmm. started at 11. Um, so, and mostly white clients, um, like their children would go to bed at 7 p.m. You know, it was wild. They would go to bed at 7 p.m. and they read to them before they went to bed. They always had to bathe. And there was dinner before the bathing, which means that dinner was made at like five. You had dinner at five, right? Mm -hmm. And so this was unheard of for me. It blew your mind. It blew my mind. My mom worked three jobs. Mm -hmm. We ate cereal, mm -hmm. you know, or pancakes when we learned how to make them. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have a bedtime. And uh, my mother would be like, just graduate high school. You know, mm -hmm. that's all I ask that you do, graduate high school. Uh, and they were like, no, you're going to college and blah, blah, blah. I have a Capricorn moon, right? Mm -hmm. So I like standards. I like structure. Mm -hmm. I like discipline. I like, I, I would ask my mother to spank me. I remember I got a C in oh, geometry. Wow. And I asked her, I was like, please spank me, mother. I got a C in geometry. How dare I? And she was sitting on the toilet. And she was like, is, did, you, is that the, did you do your best? Did mm -hmm. you work hard? Did you do your best? And I said, yes. And she was like, that's all I've asked of you. And then she closed the door on me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, so like shit like that, you know. Yeah. And now I'm I'm really happy that I wasn't raised with those standards. Mm. I helped. I gave those standards to myself, mm. and I was unhappy that my mother did not live up to the expectations that I needed her to live up to mm. to make me into the uh, status quo 
person that I was working really hard Maybe to be. she knew you were self-directed. She did. She let me move out at 14. She was yeah. like, yeah, I trust that you can do this. Wow. Very, very different from my parenting <laughs> that I grew up with. All right. So um, here's another final question. Insecurity coming for inadequate academic preparation, coming from the West Side, environmental violence, these contribute to who you are. I am, we are. What can we do to begin the process with breaking through this individual and collective reality? These are some great questions, y'all. Great questions. Um, that's a really good question. Yeah, it is. Well, I, before it becomes, I was gonna say something about like, oh, how you engage with somebody else. But before it even comes down to how you engage with somebody else, like we, how, how are you engaging with you? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, are you an asshole to yourself? Mm -hmm. Are you mean to yourself? Mm -hmm. Are you like telling, if, if, if you find a limitation, are you dogging yourself about it? You know, like, so, so first it starts with your relationship with yourself. Are you kind? Are you talking to the child inside of you? Mm -hmm. Are you talking to yourself like you would talk to a child? Mm -hmm. And if you're, sh you know, I'm not gonna say a shitty person, mm -hmm. right? But um, you just did. <laughs> <laughs> I take it back. I take it back. If you're a person who has not learned healthy ways to communicate to children, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Then it's really hard to say, are you talking to yourself like you would talk to a child? Mm -hmm. Because if you smack a child and tell them that they ain't shit, then of course you're telling yourself that. Mm -hmm. And so I guess, mm -hmm. again, it comes back to like, therapy is fundamental because you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I didn't know that the way that I was speaking to myself and the standards that I was holding myself to were harmful and uh, unrealistic, mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. um, if we are community-oriented people, identify things. Like, let's say, what's one that comes, uh, patriarchy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I feel like this is something that, it, uh, there's a lot of uncovering around this, mm -hmm. right? We all perpetuate patriarchy. Mm -hmm. We all perpetuate toxic yep. masculinity. Yep. Um, all of us. All of us. Mm -hmm. And so, Let's start with one thing and define it or whatever you need to do and ask yourself, how does these actions show up for you out of you? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. do you tell little boys to be strong mm -hmm. and that they shouldn't cry? Mm -hmm. okay. Do you not hold yeah. them? Mm -hmm. Do you tell them that they can't sit on your lap anymore because they're boys? Yeah. You know, are you not being tender and kind? Are you not engaging with men who uh, come off as effeminate because you see them as weak? These are all perpetuations mm -hmm. of patriarchy, of toxic masculinity, mm -hmm. of misogyny, mm -hmm. right? So, like one thing, yeah. fat phobic, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't, I don't dog people who are full body. We all full body. What the fuck are you talking about? You know, but <laughs> I don't. I don't, I don't yeah. This is what you said. <laughs> I don't dog anybody who's fat, right? I don't say it to them. I don't da 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 da. But how do you see yourself? Mm -hmm. Are you on a diet right now? Because of why? Mm -hmm. Why do you diet? I don't understand. Mm -hmm. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. You know, so things like this. Like, how are we perpetuating these things to ourselves? And the kinder we become to ourselves, the kinder we become to others. Yeah. That's 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 beautiful. Wow. Well, I, I have to say, before before we close out, first of all, I am just so full of joy right now from and inspiration from being able to be in conversation with you and in community with all of you here and all of you watching. And, you know, Sia, from the first time we met in 2009, which was several years ago. Ten years ago. That's right. Yeah, more than several. Ten years ago. <laughs> it's about to be many, not several. Yes. Um, I was just really drawn to your spirit. You seemed um, so incredibly sharp, very intuitive. I picked up on your intuitive nature um, and a very spiritual person. And I could tell that you just had a brilliant mind that was so nimble and, and could work in so many different directions. And it has been, although we fell out of touch for a while, it has been an absolute joy for us to reconnect 
and to have conversations on the phone and for me to follow you on Facebook and read your reflections and to see your growth and development. And we've shared our own challenges and ups and downs and joys and successes. So to be able to share that with you has meant the world to me. This is an absolute honor for you to be my first conversation partner. I want to thank you so much for sharing your journey with us um, and, um, and really allowing us into very intimate parts of your life. And for also you know, giving us some encouragement to you know, how we can see ourselves as agents of change, how we can practice self-respect and kindness and emanate that to others around us, and how really there is no separation between who we are and our environment. Our environment is a reflection of us. We want to change our environment, we change ourselves. And so I just want to uh, ask the audience to invite me and give you a warm round of uh, applause and thank you. And again, I'd like to thank all of you for coming tonight in the live audience. I'd like to thank all of you who are tuning in live on Facebook, as well as those of you who will tune in later. I have to remember to look at the camera, I, but I do see y'all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, I'd like to give another um, shout out to Affinity Community Services. Yeah. You know, this is a fantastic organization. <laughs> I am honored to be a part of ever since I was a baby dyke and, <laughs> and was looking for a community um, of folks um, uh, who uh, were doing some positive things in the world. And so very honored to be a part of this community. Affinity Community Services, you want to look us up. It's a fantastic organization. You can uh, visit our website at www.affinity95.org. You can also find us on Facebook. If you go to Facebook, just put in Affinity Community Services. Uh, we are also on Twitter. It's Affinity underscore CS. That's Affinity underscore CS. And um, I'd like to share with you the next date of our podcast. So again, uh, Living Room Chats at Affinity Podcast will be the third Wednesday of each month at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Our next date is Wednesday, March 20th. It will be live streamed on Affinity Community Services Facebook page. And again, be a part of the conversation on social media. Hashtags are LRC Affinity Podcast and LRC Kelly Podcast. And of course, hashtag we are affinity. Thank you so much again for tuning in and we will see you in March. Bye. <laughs>